Hello, I've been getting a lot of questions about one of our homework problems that involves two charges and calculating the net electric field at the origin of this system. So, I want to work you out, give you my perspective, and I'm going to sprinkle in a little bit of MATLAB use, just so you can see some examples of using a tool like that to help you with what could be a long series of tedious calculations, and really just have the tool do that in quick steps for you, so you don't have to repeat if there's ever any mistakes or computational errors, just finding all of our powerful tools to solve hard problems. So, let's dive into this. We've got this picture of two charges, and we're trying to find the net field at the origin. Well, let's draw a picture, right? I always like to start off by drawing a picture of our problem here, so I'm going to give myself a little space here. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So our setup is, is that we've got a charge Q1, one, two, three, four, right here. It's a negative charge, so I'm using blue to represent. And I'll use a positive charge. Q2 is positive, right there. And we want to know what is the net electric field at the origin due to these two charges. Well. Let's look at the electric fields each charge is producing. Q1, being a negative charge, is creating an attractive electric field. So there's going to be this E1 pointing towards it. So there's our E1 field. 2, being a positive charge, is going to be pointing radially away. And things to note, for this particular problem, not only is charge 2 closer, which will make the electric field stronger, charge 2 magnitude-wise is also bigger for the numbers that were generated for me. Remember, a lot of these numbers will be randomly generated for you. So either way, this guy is closer and a bigger, uh, and a bigger charge, so this electric field must be longer, right? Because it's going to be a stronger field. So I've drawn it scale-wise to capture that. We're looking for the sum of these two electric fields, principal superposition, we can just add these two. Hold on, this is E2. And I'll use the parallelogram method to add these. I'll go do, 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 do. Just draw parallel projections of the red and blue vector. And the edge of that parallelogram is what the net field's gonna look like. And I'll draw that in green. And I'll use N for E net. So, Without having done any detailed analysis, we already know our answer is going to lie somewhere in the negative x region, positive y. Great. Before we go on, things I like to do, I like to write down a list of my gibbons, if you know my inside jokes there. So, what are the values given to us for this problem? Well, we have a q1 equals a 4e to the minus ninth for nanocoulombs, right? Q4. And I'd like to point out that this is a negative charge. Q2 is going to be for us 6e to the minus ninth coulombs. Call that positive. Now we have these positions here, right? The positions of this distance here, this distance here. We'll call this A and B. And let's just define that right now. A is 0 0.6 meters. And B equals. 0 0.8 meters. Sketching those out. There's A, there's B. Right. So, how are we going to go about doing this? How are we going to find the net electric field? Well, for starters, what we want to do is break this down to its steps. Let's find the magnitude and components of electric fun, one, electric field one, components and for magnitude and components of two then add things vectorally. So the big picture, what we're going to do is find our net field. Our E net as a vector problem is going to be E1 vector plus E2 vector. Breaking that into component form, you could write this as E net x equals E1 x, E2 x, and E net y equals E1y plus E2y. So these here are just, whoop, we're losing a little bit of that equation. Let's shrink me down. Ta da. These two equations here are just the component forms of this 
magnet of this vector equation, and I prefer my vector equations. They synthesize information very nicely. So let's go to breaking down the components. Find E1, then find E2. So let's scroll a little bit. I'm going to find the magnitude of E1 to start things off with. And I know that I need to compute kq over some distance squared. Well, let's figure out what that distance is. So q1 is here. There's the distance from charge 1 to the origin. This is what I labeled B. This is what I labeled A. There is some angle swept out here that I'm going to call theta for now. We're not too concerned about theta at this point. So I can say, hey, R1 is going to equal the square root of A squared plus B squared. And then E1 will be k magnitude. I don't care that q1 is negative. Magnitudes can never be negative. They are positive definite things. So q1 over r1 squared. Now, I know it's very tempting for all of you to crunch the numbers, plug these into numbers. Fine, you feel productive putting these into numbers, but I want to show you another technique. Me, personally, I prefer keeping them in these variable forms, but I know that temptation as you're trying to upgrade your ability to solve problems and you want to say, these are numbers I can compute, let's compute them. Let me show you a technique. Let's start to bring in our MATLAB tool. So I'm going to open up my terminal. So this might not be MATLAB as you're used to seeing of that big boxy window, but this is the same thing. I have a script editor here where I'm going to write a program that I call homework one. And down here is that command window where we can do our computations to get our answers. So let's start to write things out. I'm going to write all my variables in here, do our computations here. So first let's define our Coulomb constant, 8.99, e to the ninth. And I like to remind myself, hey, this is Coulomb's constant. And let's start to work out our problems. Q1, I remember, was 4e to the minus, oh, minus ninth, go away. 40 minus ninth, Coulombs. Always put a little parentheses there. Q2 was 6e to minus ninth. You might notice I'm putting these semicolons here. That's also Coulombs. We have our distance A, which was 0 0.4, no, like 0 0.6 meters. And I'm just going to copy that. Oop. And our B was 0 0.8. All right, so I've saved this file. Now let's run it. Homework one. What'd that do? Well, it stored all these variables here. There's A, there's B. Q1, Q2, just store them in there. So let's clear this up, make things nice and pretty. If you're not comfortable, you're not familiar using MATLAB, what's the point of these semicolons? Oop, go away. So I just deleted the semicolon here and here. If I run homework one again, they're printed to the screen. And that's all the semicolon does, whether you print it to the MATLAB command window or not. I don't want to print them, so I'll put them back here. Now back to our questions. We are curious about what is R1 and E1. Well, let's compute them. All right? Find E1. R1 is going to equal the square root of A squared. Hold on. Plus B squared. Let's suppress that. Why, why the dots? Uh, MATLAB is trying to do vector computation so you can do large arrays of computationals very quickly. We're doing scalar computations mostly. So what I'll say is, for most purposes of what we're doing at these entry level MATLAB stuff, 
The dots are not technically necessary, but they're good practice. And I'll save a whole discussion of MATLAB computation. I just want to show you the tool for making our calculations quick and easy. I want to find the magnitude of E1, and that'll be K times Q1, dot to make MATLAB happy, dot divided by R1 squared. Boom. So I have my E1 and R1 magnitude, so let's run these. Homework 1. What was R1? If you look at the numbers that are generated for me, this will be very easy. R1 is just one meter. But let's say it wasn't uh, an easy number that popped, out, that popped out. Then we'd have it just stored in this R1 variable. So it helps us reduce the complexity of our camera. Let's look at E1 magnitude. All right. So let's write these down. It's just a reminder. One, and this is 35.96 newtons per coulomb. I'm going to predominantly, this is what I'm going to reference. Right? You can call back to the 36 newtons per coulomb later on if that helps you. But I'll keep things in variable form to keep things consistent because if you're working on this problem and your numbers are slightly different, this will be a different number for you. And so it won't be beneficial for you to carry around this numerical value over and over again if it's not the value you need. Whereas this, this will always carry through. All right, so we've got our magnitude. Let's get the components now. Let's suppress. Yeah. Let's keep going. I've got the magnitude. Let's now find, find the components of E1. So, first thing I have to do is call out the most common mistake I see. And this is most common mistake that I see. Is to do this. You say, hey, let me compute the components, so I'll just modify the distances. If it was A, B, well, in, well E1, X will be K, Q1 over A squared, and E1, Y will be K, Q1 over B squared. Let's get U out of here. So you say, well, let's just modify the distances. The distances is the A length, the or the X length, the Y length, and we're done. And I really, really must emphasize, absolutely wrong. If you're using these distances to compute the components, what you're actually doing is computing the magnetic field, or sorry, the electric field, at brand new positions in space. You're not computing this guy. You're computing brand new electric fields and substituting that as the components. So this is absolutely an incorrect methodology. We have to use our vector components to break things down correctly. So let's do that. Let's draw our picture here. What we have is electric field doing this. There's E1. E1, Y, E1, X. And fancy that. Remember that theta from earlier? Exact same theta we've got again. So what I can say is cosine of that angle theta, cosine will be E1, X over E1. Or E1, X equals the magnitude that we found before, E1 cosine theta. Now there's a couple of school of thoughts of how to handle the cosine theta. We could explicitly compute it or express it in other terms. Here's how I do it. I go back to just the geometry of the problem. R1, A, B, theta. Well, I can say cosine theta in terms of these positions is A over R1. 
And so I'll just make that substitution here. I will substitute this into there for the cosine theta. Instead of computing what that angle theta is, because I don't particularly care what it is. I don't know, something around 60 degrees about there. But I don't care what it is. No. Ignore it. And what I'll say is E1x is going to be the magnitude we found before times A over R1, where this A over R1 is cosine theta. Now I'll say similarly, it's the exact same analysis to get the Y component. E1Y will be E1, and this will be B over R1. It comes from using the sine angle. So Now we're not done here. We want to make sure to represent this in vector form. So E1 vector is going to be E1 A over R1 x hat, E1 B over R1 y hat in its vector form. And this is when we check our signs. This is when we say, is this positive or negative? And so we'll scroll back to what we sketched out in the beginning. Our right. E1 vector, it better have a positive x component, positive y component. And that goes back to this guy was negative. Who cares that this is positive or negative? The sign of this being positive or negative depends on where around Q1 we measure the electric field. So you always have to be careful when you're keeping the minus signs on the charges. You go back to your vector picture and say, are my components positive or negative? And you plug the signs back in. So for us, we're at Lucky. Our setup says these components are both positive, positive. So positive, positive. We're good. We have our components. Now let's pull our terminal back up. And let's just compute this for now. E1. Let's see here. E1 is going to be E1 mag times a divided by r1. Now I want to use the power of MATLAB to make these vector computations. So I'm going to use square brackets, comma, and put this into vector form. E1 mag dot times b dot divided by r1. Close that off. Oh. Close that up. Work one. There's an error. Where's my error? Let's see here. E1 mag times times a times a dot five by r one dot times b dot five by r one. Oh, I have the dot in the wrong spot. So I'll move that over. Dot times. Dot times. All right, run that again. Homework one. All right. And now I have this awesome result that the vector form is stored in MATLAB. I don't have to worry about computing these individually. I've just had MATLAB do it together simultaneously. And I can quickly check myself. Remember before, we said that this magnitude should be about 35.96 newtons per coulomb. So I have my components. If I use the Pythagorean theorem, I can check that I've done my mathematics correctly because these components squared should come back to that 35.96 uh, components. So let's see here. If I want to call just the x component, I say E1 the first component, the second component, pull those out. So what we're going to do is Pythagorean square root of E1 squared plus E2 squared 35.96. So I know I've done my vector decomposition correctly because my components, Pythagorean theorem, back to the magnitude that we, that we found before. Nice. All right, so we've got our components of E1. Let's move on 
to E2. Find the magnitude of E2. Now, luckily for us, this one's going to be a little bit more straightforward. E2 will be K, Q2, over what I'll call R2 squared. And then component-wise, well, come back to our beginning. Let's write this out. Five components of E2. We only have an x component in the minus x direction. So when we compute the magnitude, we effectively already have the x components. But to keep in this turning crank wheel, I will be explicit here. And we'll write this as e2 vector is minus the magnitude of e2 in the x hat direction plus 0 in the y hat direction. And let's add that to our little script here. Right. We'll find e2. e2 mag equals k dot times q2 dot divided by r2. Oops, didn't find r2. r2 was in fact distance a. So we'll do a squared. And then e2 as a vector is going to be minus e2 mag 0. All right. Run this. One thing to note, computing the values. We said that the length of e2 better be longer than the length of e1. e1 was 35.96. Our e2 better be a bigger number. And so let's compute that, E2, minus 150 newtons per coulomb. Matches our expectations. And we have this in vector form already. So this is where the real advantages start to come in. We want to find the magnitudes. We want, we want to find E net. So, so. We'll find E net through vector addition. Carrying back to that very first expression we wrote, that E net will be vector E1 plus E2. All right. Once again, as a side comment, the most common mistake I see here. is to say E net equals the 36 newtons per coulomb plus the minus 150 newtons per coulomb. Add the magnitudes, right? Don't add magnitudes. Add components. Right? Never ever ever add by magnitudes. That's not how vectors combine. They have to combine by component forms. Right? Now luckily for us, if we go to our tool up here, we already have our vectors in component forms. So, compute e net, it'll be E net equals E1 plus E2. We've already put this in component form, so if I compute this, E net, there's E net. Already done the vector component additions. Wonderful result. So, e net, if I do this correctly now, this is going to be. Minus 128.26 newtons per coulomb in the x hat 
28.7677. Anyways, we're cool. And the Y hat. On my paper, I'm cutting these off at two decimal points. On the tool, well, I'll store all the decimal places here. I don't have to worry about routing errors here because they're stored in the computer right now. We want to know the magnitude, right? And that. If we label these Enet X, Enet Y, then the magnitude of Enet will be Pythagorean theorem. It'll be square root of Enet X, square that, Enet Y, square that. Boom. Here we'll do this this way, All right? Let's see here. E net magnitude will be square root of E net one square that. Plus E net two square that. Work one. I get something in the ballpark of 131.44 newtons per coulomb. Last stage, angle respect to the positive x-axis. Angle with respect to as the WRT with respect to, by any other respect to positive x-axis. Now I like to draw a little picture to help us visualize what we mean. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So what we have here is a vector that looks like this going off in that direction. We want to know this angle that I'm going to call oops, don't want an arrow here, turn that off. This is the angle we're looking for, an angle that I'm going to call phi. What I'm going to compute is this, is this angle theta. And the reason for that is it's pretty straightforward for me to get that theta. It's here's e net x, here's e net y, here's the magnitude e net. And so I can use any combination of the trig functions, sine, cosine, or tangent with, we know all these, we know the net and we know the components. So it's completely up to you which one you want to use. For me, I chose tan theta. Arbitrary choice to be honest here. So tangent of theta is going to be e net y over e net x. e net y over e net x. Now the thing I do to avoid potential SIGN sign errors is I compute with the magnitude of this the absolute value. And I do that just to avoid potential errors. All right. So our theta is going to be the arc tangent of the absolute value of E net Y over E net X. Let's put that in our little tool here. Let's see here. Find angle to positive x-axis. Theta is going to be a tan absolute value of, let's see here, the y component divided by the x component. Now if you're more comfortable with computing these angles, you might know quicker ways to pull out the phi. That's totally fine. I just want to show you a baseline idea. If you're not comfortable with these things, how to get through these. I'm showing you just the baseline, just rigorous. You can always do these techniques to get those out. Yes, there are absolutely faster ways to do these, and I'm not discrediting or even discouraging those techniques. But I just want to show you a complete methodology to get there. So I now know how to compute my theta angle. Here it is. What we're looking for, remember, is this phi. So we have one more additional step doing things in radians, our phi angle is going to be 
pi minus theta, because here's pi radians. Subtract out our theta, we'll get the phi angle that we are looking for. So, let's put that up here. Our phi is going to be pi minus theta. Run the program. Where do we have our error? Or line 24, column 6. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's close. Oh, X. That should be a 1. There we go. Run it. We are happy. There's our theta and radians. We want to know our phi and radians, 2.92 radians. I believe our homework software asks for the answer in degrees. So let's convert that degrees. That'll be 180 degrees. 180 degrees by, by pi. And so our phi is going to equal about 167.36 degrees. So I hope you found this very useful, very instructive to work out doing our vector components. And we'll see you all next time.